Welcome to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY and to Prelude 21, uh, Start Making Sense. Um, it is our annual um, theater and performance festival celebrating the work of New York theater artists and ensembles and it's hard enough in normal times to create work for the stage and for uh, spaces inside and outside but in the time of Corona we all are faced with exceptional challenges and uh, we are here to celebrate again the extraordinary achievements that come out of the New York theater community. It is time, I think, and we feel, to start making sense to ask uh, questions. Why are we making theater? But also how are we producing it and for whom? And uh, this is a great investigation again into the um, mechanics uh, of making art uh, in New York City and we also invited uh, theater ensembles from around the US from Detroit and Cincinnati, St. Louis and uh, Philadelphia, uh, New Orleans um, to join us and um, this will be an extraordinary look into uh, what is on the minds of artists right now. We also have uh, many panel discussions. Uh, we have uh, an award which we're giving out uh, to honor uh, uh, outstanding members of the New York theater community, so I would like to all of you to uh, join in and uh, get an insight of what uh, is happening. Kwam Gamelmo Hemo. Greetings, everyone. I am Opalanya Tet, also known as uh, Ryan Victor Pierce. I'm a member of He, Him, His. I'm a member of the Nanakoke Eleni Lenape Tribal Nation. And I'm also a first year student here at the Graduate Center at CUNY. And I'm also the founder and artistic director of, of Eagle Project. Um, and I certainly want to thank CUNY and the Eagle Center uh, for the Prelude Festival and also to HowlRound for uh, streaming in, and hosting us uh, today. So, uh, Wanishi, uh, thank you. And, uh, and I'm, it's a, a privilege and honor to be joined by three wonderful Native American performing artists. And uh, we're just going to go around to open up this discussion and, and have um, everyone introduce themselves. Um, I will start in, these, in this kind of Zoom square format. Uh, we'll kind of go clockwise. Uh, so I will start to um, looking at the camera to my left, uh, which is uh, Ms. Rihanna Yazi. Hi, <laughs> hi Ryan, thank you. Yat e yinishke Rihanna Yazi, dohat i nishle trenazani bashishchin nehitle dashche do trichini dashnale kutegodinetsa. My name is Rihanna Yazi, and I am a member of the uh, Navajo Nation, a citizen, and I'm a playwright. I'm a director, and I'm a filmmaker, and I'm the artistic director of. Uh, a theater company called New Native Theater that's 13 years old and based in Dakota Territory, also known as the Twin Cities in Minnesota. And um, I'm just really um, honored to, to be here and to chat with these wonderful, wonderful artists I've always looked, looked up to and just enjoy their beautiful work. Yeah. Great, thank you so much, Rihanna. And uh, uh, next, uh, going around on my clockwise uh, fashion, is um, is uh, Vicky Ramirez. Hi, Chua Iskanahe, Giafe Vicky Ramirez. Hi, I'm Vicky. I'm a playwright, uh, enrolled member of the Tuscarora Nation from Six Nations originally, but have been living in New York City for about 30 years. Um, not a multi hyphenate. I'm so impressed by you guys doing all those wonderful jobs. Pretty awesome. <laughs> I uh, do some writing and some teaching, and I also work with podcasts and script writing, uh, screenplay writing as well. And it's a delight and honor to be here and enjoy this conversation with these wonderful people. It'd be a lot of fun. And so, Yawa, thank you. And back to you, Ryan. Great, thank you, Vicky. And and next uh, is uh, joining us today is Mara Garcia. 
My name is Maura Garcia. Um, I am a dancer, a choreographer, and an erotic artist. I am Cherokee, non-enrolled. I'm originally from North Carolina and also Madame Mesquite. Um, and I'm just, I'm not Thai, so I'm standing in for Thai. <laughs> um, it says, I think it still says Thai on the, uh, on the information. He could not be here, uh, but he was the curator that chose my work that is being shown in the festival. So I'm just delighted to be here with y'all and I'm looking forward to talking. Great, yes, thank you, Mara. And, and as I said, we're honored to have you with us today. Um, and honor to have everyone. Um, so, uh, and I'll start with Mara actually on our first on our first topic uh, for this afternoon um, is uh, playing with forms. Uh, would you mind sharing with us and um, and and in our audience this afternoon as to as to the different kinds of of uh, artistic forms that you play with in your work and, and how that may um, you know uh, counter. Um, the kind of traditional Euro-American um, style of, of dance and or theater. Yes, thank you. And I just took off my bracelets because I realized they were making jingling noises, which may be interesting, but probably not so great. Um, you know, I, I've been thinking about this a lot, especially uh, since the beginning of the pandemic and also with the beginning of um, the protests and a lot of the equity movements. Um, but some of my thinking about this uh, was really helped by a man named Charles Coronejo. Um, he is Maori from Aotearoa and is a performer, choreographer, a dancer. And I was able to take his, uh, his intensive while in Vancouver with, um, Raven, with Raven Spirit, which is a a dance ensemble there, wonderful dance ensemble led by Michelle Olson. And so one of the things he said was that uh, the movements and the actions and the work that we do as indigenous people, whether they are traditional, you know, quote unquote, traditional things that we're doing in official ceremony or things that we're doing in our home, like cooking, uh, planting, all of these activities, when they are repeated and taught and shown, those are valid forms of movement. We have been practicing them, you know? So if you grew up in a place where there's red dirt, like I did, um, playing as a child with that red dirt and that you know, manipulation of the dirt and playing with it and forming little objects with it. If my brother's watching, he knows what I'm talking about. We pretended we were making pottery. We weren't really making pottery, but... The point is we were playing with that dirt. We had our hands in that dirt and later on planting in that dirt. And so those types of movements, um, those actions and those connections uh, that we form are also valid. They're valid forms of movement and they're valid places to create from. So, um, and they're as valid as something that, you know, might you might learn in a ballet class or if you go to a, choreography theory class and talk about these prom these prompts, which may seem random to us because they don't come from our experience or from our culture. Um, our experiences, our culture, and our the work and the actions that we do are as uh, valid as what you may see in a kind of university setting. So to me, that that's really interesting. Um, and I'm really interested in the form, um, so the actual form of work, for example, I have pieces that I've created that are based on uh, digging or that are based on the way you, uh, I don't know if you can say, the way you twist corn off a stalk, um, the way you put seeds in the ground. I have a piece that's uh, ancestor dances. That it's when my grandma is shaking that uh, skillet over the, you know, that. So these actions of work, um, they're really fascinating to me. So those are movements that I put in my choreography. Um, another form I'm also fascinated with is the form of each person. For example, uh, each of us have things that we do over and over. If I sat there and watched each of you and you watched me 
at, probably at the end of this, we can come up with some gestures that we're always doing, you know, like the dance of Vicky, you know, the dance of Fran, the dance of Rihanna. Um, and when I'm just going through life, I see people moving and, and I think of that movement as their movement. And so people appear in my choreography. Sometimes I tell them, sometimes I don't, they don't, they don't know, you know, that they're there. Um, but to me, that is another form. So the, the dance of someone else, meaning the dance of their actual spiritual being, their physical form, uh, that is another type of form that I use in my work. Um, so I could talk about this a lot, but now I'm going to be quiet. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> wow, thank thank you, Mara. And yeah, and then that's and that's so empowering, you know. I mean, and and um, yeah. Uh, that, that I guess I'll just leave it at that. That that, that that just sounds so empowering in terms of, in terms of the the actions of what we do and how they can be art and and even um, I guess how many sometimes are those traditional ways of of doing things is still ingrained in us in ways that we don't even realize. So I really really thank you for that. Um, uh, I I like to uh, you know keep keep this subject open and 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 move to uh, to to Vicky. Uh, Vicky, would you mind sharing with us, um, yeah, in terms of how you, um, the, the the forms that, um, yeah, the forms that inspire your work and, and how, how you how you how you use them in your in your creation? It's uh, really strange because I, I I'll be I was discussing this with somebody else the other day. It's like, how intentional am I when it comes to my work? And the truth of the matter is, I tend to not start writing from an intentional sort of point of view. It comes generally like a thought or like a visceral response to something or a moment um, music in my head or something. And I start writing from there. And um, so when it comes to, as far as I, I, I have this habit of writing and, and it's a habit that a lot of non-native theater makers have suggested I cure myself of, but I have this habit of writing in the magical realm, always weaving it in with my plays as, as I write. And, and, and I, I like, I just, for me, you know, we're here, but, but the reality of here, the reality of our story, the reality of us being is not just this three dimensional world. Like I'm not sure how many dimensions there are. There's maybe six or 12 or 14. So I almost think like to me, magical realm, the spirit realm, the ancestor realm is almost like dark matter. So while our stories are happening, they're weaving around us and, and inhabiting the space with us and sort of supporting us. And so I tend to write that way. And then I get a lot of dramaturgical questions about, uh, but this seems out of left field. And it's like, no, no, that's her auntie. Or no, no, that's bad one. And um, so uh, that's sort of how I I sort of work within I, the form, let the form go. It's just how, you know, just letting the way we were raised and told our stories and told to live in the world and just inhabit the space of the play itself. And I try to work to fit it within, you know, I, I, I mean, people say, you know, the Aristotelian play structure, it's like, I don't even necessarily always know what that means. It's like, I went back and Googled it and sort of, okay, let me see, how does that apply? But it, 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 it's, it's more uh, from an organic form of trying to tell the story and, and get the moment and 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 the spirit and the spirituality of that moment happening within the story because they're all connected i i just i it's hard for me to separate it from my storytelling so that's how i do that <laughs> and i think rihanna looks like she wants to talk mm -hmm. uh, yes rihanna you're you're next <laughs> oh uh, rihanna i think you're you're muted I, I guess someone unmuted me right when I unmuted me. <laughs> yeah, when you when you mentioned, I guess it's a trigger, right? Uh, when you mentioned Aristotelian uh, a play form, um, that that's that's what I was thinking about um, when uh, the question was asked, because um, the um, 
the way that native folks um, tell stories and write stories, it's just, um, it's not often rooted in that um, Aristotelian format, which is really engineered to, um, to have a person's uh, nervous system uh, do things involuntarily. That's, I think, I think that's my analysis of what Aristotelian play form is. And we see it, we see it in film structure, right? We see it in every well-made play. Um, you know, where um, my theater company, we just produced a play by Yvette Nolan called The Unplugging. And uh, for, for those who don't know Yvette Nolan, um, she's just one of the most um, respected and lauded uh, First Nations theater makers in Canada. And um, we were really um, lucky to have the opportunity to host her here during the window in the pandemic and this, this uh, fall when we could do an outdoor production. And, uh, you know, uh, this, this play, it very much follows this um, non-Aristotelian structure, this sort of like more organic indigenous way of, of being. Because um, one of the things that um, Aristotelian structure is, it's like deep in conflict, you know? And I think a lot of times native folks kind of want to avoid conflict, <laughs> right? And instead of like conflict, conflict, conflict as um, uh, um, plot points, um, we have complication, 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 right? Um, and then also we often focus characters, just like Vicky had mentioned, you know, in, in the spirit world, um, dimensions that are normal parts of our lives, but aren't necessarily part of that white Western Judeo-Christian Cartesian uh, worldview. Um, and then also we have characters um, that are, that we value such as older women that you don't often see older women or two older women um, at, at the center of stories. And so this play did all of those things, but there was something that happened in the actual performance of the play that um, kind of blew my mind because I didn't realize this until it was actually in production. And again, remembering we come from uh, oral cultures. Um, we didn't rely on the written word to pass down information. Um, and so when you read the play, you, I think you can see these markers of in, indigenous structure, but then um, when it's actually performed and uh, being and it was directed by Yvette Nolan, there was this really beautiful moment in the play that is described, but when it's actually played out, it's a, it's a silent scene. It's a silent scene of building. And there wasn't even like, usually in, in a play, um, you know, the producer would kind of like freak out, like, why is, why is, why are these actors just doing things, but there's no words and there's no music accenting it to tell the audience, you should be feeling this. Um, so it was this moment where they were building the camp that is created in the first act of the play. Um, and, and it was just an invitation to stillness and contemplation and being rather than doing and and it clicked for me like oh that is a huge piece of indigenous storytelling um it it we have so many moments where we ask the audience and those are legitimate plot points we ask the audience to be instead of to do and and to contemplate and, and it's very easy on the nervous system because I think another thing that we do as uh, native people when we write works is that um, I think that indigenous culture is, is, some, is a culture that is incredibly respectful of how a person wants to hold and conduct their own body and their own body boundaries. Like there aren't a lot of uh, practices in our cultures, and I'm kind of generalizing as indigenous people, where, where we are uh, being very invasive about how to be a person, just like we, we didn't have these, these strict um, uh, rules with gender, right? We didn't have these strict rules around sexuality. We didn't have these, these policing of the body. And, and that's another really interesting thing that like, I, I think that is a fantastic way that um, native artists explore form. And as we take that Euro form and we make it our own and create it um, 
because it, you know, I mean, now it, it's a form of communication that all as Americans, we, you know, we, we do, but I just, I still think that there's so many beautiful moments of intact native specificity and culture that, um, that we as native artists put into our work and that needs to be appreciated, but some, but it's also something that I think that non-native people need to actually be taught and they need to uh, learn about just in the way that, you know, we go to the MoMA and we learn about modern art and we figure out what's cubism and, you know, and, and surrealism and all of that. I think in the same way that um, it, there needs to be some reciprocity um, so that um, our, the ways that we um, manipulate form can be appreciated more. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, um, Brianna. And, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I just know, especially, you know, being here in, in New York City, which is also, of course, Lenape Hoking, but, um, but the idea of just being without doing something, I think, is, <laughs> you know, it really is kind of a, or it feels like it's a, it, would, it would be a foreign thing to, to, many people, to many people here, and I'm sure other parts of the country as well. Um, thank you, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the next... Um, just to kind of to take this subject matter and, and, and segue in, into our next. Um, and, and actually, I'll, I'll start with, um, uh, with Vicky on this. Um, you know, we, we talked about form, and, and I guess we also you know, touched on inspiration as well. Um, but so are there certain, um, what kind of subject matters do you, do you find yourself usually, you know, gravitating towards or, or, or interest you um, uh, in, your, uh, in your work? For me, I, um, again, probably just because of how I was raised, it's, it's all about, um, and for me, it's about intersectionality. It's about being indigenous and being in the world outside as well. It's kind of, you know, that push pull that sort of, what do we lose when we have to compromise and be in this sort of, colonized big space outside of our little individualized spaces. And it's, it's all the contradictions and, and difficulties of that, the divided loyalties, the, the, again, the wanting to avoid conflict and yet at the same time wanting to stay honorable, stay living in the good way with, you know, in, in connection with your community and in connection with the land and living respectfully. So it's those little conflicts. Like most of my stories are, are, are about basically, like I, I like to write from a contemporary native viewpoint um, from people who are in a compromised situation and sometimes they've gotten themselves into it and sometimes it's sort of been thrust upon them. But it's, it, I, I like the idea of duality and, and and dealing with that. It's sort of like the twins. I know I'm always rattling on about the twins, but the creator and his brother. I like that question of the balance, the push pull. And, and it's funny because in Western Christian tradition, that means God and the devil, good and evil. And it's not with us. It's it's not good and evil. It's good mind, bad mind, clear headed, not so clear headed, that sort of both, and yet both create change, both create impact on the world, both like, um, what is it? Like good mind created the fish, bad mind created the bones, so you had to work for it and you didn't gobble them all up. The thorns on the fruit, the thorns on the berries. That was to make sure you didn't overfeed yourselves, you know, and things like that. So there's, there's, it's kind of that sort of balance. And, um, and I do like, I really sort of want to deal with who we are today, right now. Um, and, and things like my latest piece is about a uh, woman who has a missing sister, but she, it's also about erasure, like sort of the erasure of our culture in 
the world at large as far as in the media, because media is how we validate ourselves now, sadly. And so the erasure of who we are in the media, the erasure of our issues. Um, COVID-19 was the biggest example, what, what the Diné folks went through. And it didn't even get noticed until like four months later. Like what, you know, they had the highest COVID rates and everybody's like, well, maybe they should. And it's like, maybe they should have access to fresh water supplies, folks, you know, like there's, there's, I mean, I'm speaking on your people's behalf, Rihanna, and I shouldn't, but, and I apologize for that, but you know what, I'm just speaking in a general sense, it's just a, sort of this, so I tend to write, she circles back, again, I'm writing and talking in circles, because that's me, I'm the circle, I make my way around, but my inspiration tends to be what has ticked me off recently, <laughs> what has ticked me off about being indigenous in the modern world. And yeah, so it, like Uchiwake, which is actually uh, our word, Skarube for bitter, um, means like bitter for food, but I'm, I'm choosing to apply other interpretations <laughs> as well. But it's, it's about this woman who is fed up with uh, performative, uh, performative activism and just wants something real to happen in her situation. But so that's that's my inspiration is just like whatever sort of frustrates me at the time and I sort of get around to it. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, yeah, like I said, it's, it's, it's never, I never think it out ahead of time. It's usually just something that starts me and, and then I start writing. And next, thank you. Great, thank you, Vicky. Um, and um, next, uh, I, I'll I'll pose that uh, that question to, uh, to to you, Mara. Actually, I got lost in those circles, which were so wonderful. Could so could you restate that question? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. No, no problem. Um, basically, I was just saying, you know, in in terms of uh, segueing from uh, from forms. Um, and, and we also did touch on inspiration. I, I, I wanted to ask um, each of our panelists um, the subject matter that they find themselves uh, most interested in or that they gravitate, gravitate towards or, or inspires their, their work and creative process. Yes, um, I will say two things. And one that actually has to do with that circle and that spiral. Um, so, I will say, uh, but I, something I learned from my mother and also uh, my grandmother is that your kindness, for example, uh, and your charity, if you will, begins at home. So meaning in the center, right? So don't just be nice and cute and sweet to the people that you meet on the street you don't know. You Be nice and kind and sweet to the people you speak to every day. Like um, my grandma didn't have a lot of money, but she still for the, you know, for the mission Catholic church, she made the cakes for the bake sale, but she made them at home always first. She never, all her children, they had cake too. And so uh, for example, Cherokee designs, when you make a design, they start in the center and then outward. Cherokee language, when you make the words, they start in the center, you have a core and then on the beginning and the end, it has to do with who's talking and where it's going on. So to me, um, a lot of the time when I'm inspired to make things, they start in the middle and then they move outwards, you know, from um, me to family, to community, to world community, to other folks, other beings. Um, and so that that's an inspiration for me, that circle and that spiral you know, this never ending um, and always going. So that, that's something uh, that is inspirational to me. And also the story, I, I think in stories, you know, I remember things in stories. If you tell me a story, if you give me some information about dates and generals, I will not remember anything, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but if you tell me a story, I can remember that. And I, re I tell stories and I, I remember stories. And so, um, I know that that retelling of the story, whether it be a story about, um, you know, what numbers are important, whether it be a story about how to cook certain something, you know, whatever that story is, because I've made dances about all of these things. So whatever that story is, it's about the retelling of the story 
to honor the storyteller, but also to make sure that information gets out there because stories are made to be told. There's people need to know that information. And so um, I, you know, whether it's something small, you know, it may be a short story, it may be a very longer story, but that, that format and that information uh, is forever inspiring to me. That's great. Thank you, Wanishi. Thank you, Mara. Um, and um, and I, I pose the same uh, the same question to uh, to, to Rihanna. Yeah. Um, what what is inspiring? Um, I think um, I think that uh, when I want to tell a story. So now that I'm I'm into filmmaking, I just just about to premiere my first film, which is crazy. Um, <laughs> and, um, and then also just as a playwright. So I, I really do think of myself as, um, as a playwright, um, as, as a script writer, first of all, more than anything. And I think that um, a big piece of why I write what I write is because I'm trying to figure out why these things happen. Um, I noticed when I was a little girl that I would turn to film and stories, television. Um, I didn't have a lot of access to theater, so that wasn't really part of it until I was like, I don't know, really like in ninth grade or college. But, um, but um, when I think about like all of the events that were happening to me as I was coming of age, I saw examples in the media. Just like Vicky said, that's how we learn how to be, um, and and so as as an artist now, I am still doing that. I'm still trying to figure out why things happen, why moments um, take place. Um, I, I'm interested in the way that people communicate. Um, I'm interested in why communication doesn't happen. I'm interested in individual personalities and what makes up that personality so that they have this life experience. Um, right, right now, um, I'm, um, I'm going to be writing a play that is kind of takes a look at like, <clears throat> I think, I think for me, um, uh, my whole life, I've always felt like, uh, <laughs> coming from Navajo family and uh, the Navajo worldview, always kind of like put me a little, felt a little different from everyone else. And I sort of was like, I didn't realize that some of these traits that I had were very specifically like handed down to me from a Navajo way of being. And some of these things are not helpful <laughs> when you're in the white world, you know? And of course, we all know what that means. It means code switching, right? And each of us were, were raised with different um, cultural specificity. And um, I don't, I don't <laughs> often code switch well. At least I, I, didn't, I didn't really understand that for a while. Um, and, you know, so like, for instance, um, if you just listen and you're not saying anything and you wait until that person is done, in, in some places, it's sort of like, uh, that's taken wrong. Like, is this person stupid? They don't understand, you know. Um, you know, in some other cultures, um, interrupting each other is like the height of communication. Like, no, this, 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 right? Um, and and a lot of times they think that as native people, you know, we don't do that. But there, there are like innumerable examples of like worldview differences. And, um, and then as older I got, I started to realize, oh, there's not only just worldview differences being native, but regionally native. There are different ways because each tribe and each region interacts in a different way. Um, and <laughs> I moved to Minnesota and that was, oh, the whole Minnesota nice thing, trying to understand how do I communicate effectively in that environment? Um, so often, oftentimes, um, I'm, I'm writing plays where I'm trying to figure out. I'm trying to figure out how how people communicate, or or I'm trying to unpack like why did this why did this pain happen? 
and and uh, tr try to understand like the the larger picture around it. And then, of course, I you know I'm always taking into account this larger sort of systemic racism that we are in this soup of in, you know living in the U.S. Um, and then, of course, you can add in a lot of other layers, right? Uh, whether you're neurotypical or not, and what are your, your specific cultural stuff. So that's what my plays are often like, sort of like figuring out. Um, um, and, um, you know, I mean, I, I don't stray from subject matter. Like, for instance, um, I've written a play about French surrealism um, and contrasting that with Native, Navajo art, um, written... Uh, written a play recently about Nancy Reagan, <laughs> and that's super fun. Um, and um, you know, and then I my my film that I just finished it's it's an intertribal love story. So uh, so that that's kind of fun to to see those interesting differences. Um, but uh, yeah, that's probably my biggest biggest inspiration. Just like I can't figure out the world. Uh, I better write about it. <laughs> Great, wonderful. Yeah, I know that's that's fantastic. And uh, well, Nancy Reagan, boy, I haven't heard that in a long time. <laughs> I wouldn't have expected that to come up on this panel, but that's true. You know, you never know. <laughs> um, although I wasn't sure if I uh, if I'd hear Aristotelian, but you know, but I, I I imagine that would certainly come up, and you know, and. And being the first year in, in the PhD theater and performance program, <laughs> you know, of course you're going to hear Aristotelian. But I must say that this is this is um, that this panel is almost like a class in of itself. So it really, I want to thank everyone for for everything that, that that's been said uh, so far. Um, uh, for our next topic, we're going to take a, a little bit of a of a turn, and um, and so uh, with with uh, obstacles. Um, in terms of creating and producing um, native theater, and and I'm just you know I, I'm just curious, basically for for this for the segment, um, you know, what are some of the obstacles that you create uh, that you that you come up against uh, in creating your work, and and what are uh, what are your methods and um, to to uh, to overcome it? Uh, and I'll start with um, uh, I'll start with with, with Mora. Thank you. I will actually. I'll speak about dance because I can't speak about theater. <laughs> but no, my my <laughs> apologies. Yeah, no, my apologies. <laughs> yeah, I, I I'm sorry. I, okay. I kind of defaulted you, but yeah, in terms of the native you know, performing arts, yes. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um. Well, I'm. La I was giggling because I'm standing in front of a closet with a curtain over it right now. So I would say space. <laughs> you know, <laughs> space. Um. And I really don't think that's necessarily native specific, um, has to do with uh, money, uh, you know, where the typical things have been awarded, which goes usually along the lines of the color lines, you know, so it's uh, part of a larger system. And then uh, just for people in general in performing arts space is a consistent uh, problem, you know, or I, I don't wanna say problem, it's a consistent thing, <laughs> a consistent issue. Um, and so being, uh, being conscious of how to get it, if it's, can, if one can afford it and if one cannot, how do you make work that's not, um, that's not made for concert space. And when I say space, you know, lots of times we're thinking of a box, right? We're thinking of a theater, but of course there's lots of other spaces and there's this, you know, thought, okay, well, if I'm making work that's not for a theater, um, where else can I use to rehearse? Where else can it be produced? How can it be um, creatively shown and marketed and, and shared if it's not in these spaces? So that whole um, thought of the concern and the issues of places to rehearse, uh, places to have work shown. Um, that's, you know, that's an ongoing thing um, that I would say is always on my mind. Uh, also here, I was just speaking with my partner um, in the so-called US, there's not, um, there is, there's not as many uh, 
dancers and choreographers who are working in non-powwow contemporary dance. And I say non-powwow because powwow is contemporary dance and beautiful and vibrant and huge and amazing. Um, but for folks who are working more on the concerty dance side, there's not a, a kind of a body, there, there's not national meetings that go on. Um, in Canada, there is. In Australia, there is. And so I've been fortunate enough to be able to be a part of that community also. But that, you know, that's something that we, we don't have here in the same way. Um, and, you know, I, I won't say, I always hate to use the word barrier because it makes it seem like we can't get through it. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's something that's there that there's not a lot of, uh, it's not as much communication and not as much support. So there's people working and, you know, we don't know, sometimes we don't know each other. We don't know what we're doing and we're working and in uh, silos and we're not as connected as uh, as we hope I would like us to be so so those are some things I would have to would have to say no thank you Th thank thank you Mara yeah yeah no it, it is fascinating in terms of some of the um, some of the the, the structural um, structural structuralism that that's in certain communities in other in other countries um, and how you, the United States differs from that. That's so, that, that's so true. And um, yeah, and space, that's true. <laughs> like space. Um, next, I'll, I'll turn to um, uh, uh, Rihanna in regards to the um, obstacles that you, that you confront in, in creating your, and producing your work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I just want to totally like validate what Ma uh, Mara is saying. So like, we need our land back. <laughs> that's what I heard. <laughs> Land back, hashtag land back. Um, yeah, well, I, you know, it's, I think, I think, um, in, personally, in my uh, my journey as as a as an artist, I think the biggest thing that has reared its head it's uh, is trauma. I um, I just think that it's um, it it is. Um, it's it's um it's something that often undermines our work and um, continues to create so many issues, um, you know, in our in our country. I mean, I'm I'm definitely certainly we as uh, Native folks we have a very specific history of this trauma that involves uh, uh, a recovery from genocide and all that entails, but and also just. As as Americans, the you know the the sin of genocide that still um, hasn't been reckon, reckoned with or reconciled. Um, um, it's um, it's just created this uh, this um, foundation of trauma in our country that we uh, we don't address, and um, and it's 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 a very um, it's a very tangible thing, um, and. Um, so I, and I always sort of like, I sort of like overcouple this trauma with like um, being complicit with white supremacy, because I think that this is a field that is so incredible. It's so incredibly attractive to be complicit with white supremacy. Um, there's so many great awards. <laughs> there are so many like, you know, like, oh, uh, these little carrots that, that, uh, you know, whether it's money or fame recognition, um, et cetera, um, that require uh, leaving your culture behind, requires code switching, um, requires even a huge amount of educating non-Native folks and others um, that, um, that I think that it's, um, it's probably the biggest struggle as, um, as, a, as a Native person to really get that under control because I think that the, the stress, I don't know. I hope I'm not going in a crazy tangent, but, but, um, but just the way that, um, the, even in like the sort of like liberal white guilt is so incredibly, um, inviting to be complicit with white supremacy when it comes to people who have, uh, communities that have a lot of trauma. And then especially as, as, uh, as a native American community, um, I have just seen too many moments where, we, um, you know, uh, have had these moments to overcome and to decide what, what do I value? What is my compass? What's my moral compass and what do I value? 
And, um, and that takes a lot of um, personal reckoning and personal understanding, overcoming historical trauma and dealing with the trauma that you grew up with. And, and, um, and I just, I, I, that's why I think that Native people are just, I, I'm constantly shown how incredibly resilient and strong we are because of all of these, um, these obstacles that do create these, um, um, these, these barriers to a, a happy, well-lived life that is uh, fulfilling with creativity. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, that's been the thing I've seen. And off and many times I, I do write about it. It's one of the things I'm trying to understand and trying to figure out, um, and, um, have, have, um, you know, over the course of my tenure at my theater company, being my being the artistic director is just trying to figure out like, what can I do to learn more about um, responding to trauma and understanding it, um, and um, you know, it's it's a constant um, it's a constant journey. It's a constant thing to learn about. Uh, no, so so true, Rihanna. And you know, I'm just I'm sitting here thinking, like, you know, I don't know as a moderator if I'm supposed to, you know, agree and be <laughs> be so enthused. But you know, obviously, I, I'm I'm a part of this community myself, so I, I can't help but like, yes, that's right, <laughs> be part of the part of the of, of the cheering section. Uh, so and, then, uh, and it doesn't and it doesn't mean that like I don't want to see Native people incredibly successful. Um, but I think we can do that without being complicit in white supremacy. I think we can do that rooted in our values and creating community the whole way. And I think that's what is so strong about us as Native people. And especially if you look at Native activism, especially since Standing Rock in 2016, it has been right. rooted in spirituality and prayer. I think the best, best parts of our activism lately has been rooted in spirituality and prayer and community and native values. And, um, and I think that's, that's, that's the direction native theater um, performing arts really must be in. Great, thank you, so true. And, um, and Vicki, uh, would you mind sharing with us uh, some of the obstacles that, um, that you find yourself coming up, coming up against and, and how, you, how you overcome it? Um, sure, uh, I just wanna co-sign both Mara and Rihanna's statements like times a hundred. And this is a conversation, Ryan, you're a moderator, but this is a native circle. So please pop up and, and talk when you wanna talk because everybody gets to talk, you know? Um, but uh, for me, it's absolutely the, it, I think it all ties to this weird sort of tool of, and, I, and I'm gonna say it, tool of white supremacy, because it does all tie back to that colonial superstructure, that in sort of invasive thing, that controlling sort of overriding aspect of things. And it's that scarcity mentality that is imposed upon the arts. I think, especially in this country, I mean, other countries are trying to fight back a bit, when you know, as you mentioned, that in Australia, they, they, New Zealand, especially too, they have more. There is more indigenous presence in arts. There's more all around support for the arts from the the community at large, and that is not what happens here. One of the things we've sort of been programmed to expect is that the arts is a privilege, not a right. This is not that we have to compete against each other to get these exclusive little awards or slots in these established, um, you know, reputable theaters to prove that we are equivalent to these playwrights, these, you know, these, these um, Western playwrights who, I, I, it's funny because I, you know, and I look at some of the playwrights that get produced over and over and over and over again. Uh, and a lot of the stories, while they're interesting and fun, a lot of them are just, don't change a moment, don't change a day. You know, I remember going to see a play because I got free tickets on one of my residencies for a family retreat in the Catskills and just watching like 
your basic little romantic contratone. And I'm like, we can't write this in native theater. If we write this, nobody produces us. They want to see our, we have to validate ourselves by lancing the boil of our trauma on stage somehow. We have to show them how our pain has impacted our lives. And forgive me, but we grew, I grew up with that every day. Like it's not the focus of the stories. I mean, it's there, of course it's there. It's pervasive and everything, but I, I just don't see the need to exploit it on stage like that. But if, but then you get the feedback that this is, oh, but it doesn't seem like a native story if you tell this story this way. And it's like, and so how many reses have you hung out at? that you're telling me that this doesn't seem like a native story to you. Um, it's, it, it's, and again, it's that thing about pitting us against each other to compete for these prizes. And don't get me wrong, I, I'm actually, I, if you win a prize without compromising yourself, that huzzah, kick butt, fabulous. I am cheering for you. I am so excited. I'm so like, Ms. Rihanna Yazi is quite, a call fish, Google her, you'll see. <laughs> but it's it's a, it makes me want to celebrate every time I see one of the prizes won. But I also it's it's taken a long time for us to be able to stand up and say, no, we're not going to cater to what you consider is important. No, we're not going to cater to like I remember somebody getting excited because the numbers had come out for the residential schools, the boarding schools. And they were like, oh, you should add that to your, and I'm like, no, because I'm not writing about that. That's, it, it's in everything I write because my family went through that, that I don't need to write that play. <laughs> I don't need to show it in there so everybody can feel bad about it collectively in a group that isn't my community. You know? <laughs> it's, um, so for me, I, I'm, I'm trying to speak up. I, I, you know, I'm very much a, I want to listen to you. I want to listen to your opinion and take it in and learn because you have expertise that I do not have. However, at the same time, I'm starting to learn when it's it's a point of view that is just not mine that is coming in. And it's like, okay, wait a second. No, you're changing the intention of the story. You're changing the intention of why I got up and wrote. Um, so that's the way I try to fight it. I try to fight it as diplomatically as possible. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't always happen, but <laughs> I tried I try to be there. Um, and but yeah, it's it's amazing how insidious that systemic racism is, you know, that that sort of monster creature. And I just for everybody, indigenous or non-indigenous, everyone, including the folks in charge right now. Art is not a privilege, it's a right. Take your space, claim your voice, step up and find every chance you can to put it out there. Um, so that's me. Absolutely, absolutely. And, um, um, and yeah, and I, I would say that's probably one of the, one of the quotes from today is that art, art is a right. <laughs> it's not a privilege. Um, so probably one of the last uh, topics that we'll have is, is the future of native theater post-pandemic and um, in terms of what your thoughts and desires are for native theater. And we'll start with, um, uh, we'll start with you, Rihanna. Okay. Oh, all right. Let's see. Um, yeah. The, the future of native theater post-pandemic. Um, well, um, I, I, I think, I think that something that, that, uh, that's come up a lot is um, a lot of native folks are reticent to be, you know, during the, during this pandemic to, to like not put our people in danger, you know, which, which uh, theater needs, <laughs> needs a group of people to be performed to. And um, so, so I do, I do think that maybe there's going to be this additional level of like care that's going to, I think that as native um, artists that we've always had that, like we always think about that, but I think that it's going to just be like even more solidified in um, some of the practices, because I think that as, um, as, as theater artists, um, when, when we learned to do theater, it was so um, steeped in white American, uh, white supremacist theater, which is so detrimental 
to the body and the nervous system to the family system um like like for instance um so many people who go into theater can't even have children so what does it mean if indigenous people go into theater and don't have children that's just like um an addi additional like sort of continuation of genocide oh these certain careers are not open to indigenous people because it it's uh, it carries on genocide i think I think that there's a lot of unspoken reasons why native people don't do theater. And I think that a lot of those unspoken reasons is because of white supremacist practices in theater. I think it's the reason why a lot of BIPOC people don't do it. Um, and then when we do, there's all of these barriers that and gatekeeping that happens. So I, I also, I, I do feel incredibly optimistic about some of the leadership change that's come into some theaters, especially with, um, new BIPOC uh, artistic directors who um, so far I've spoken to a good handful and just so much like love and care for trying to do things different and reaching out to um, Native people um, and trying to understand it. So I, I I'm optimistic, but I can tell you one thing, there hasn't been one white artistic director from a predominantly white institution that has reached out to me. So I don't know if those folks are gonna change. So <laughs> they do, and they absolutely need to change. But I also just think about like it within native circles, I think about like tribal colleges that, um, that um, every year there's an AHEC uh, uh, conference, American Indians in Higher Education. At one time I got to be the judge for the theater. Um, there was a theater contest, like four different uh, tribal, I think it was like eight, and it was narrowed down to four by the time, you know, I sat in front of and watched. But, but I was just so like inspired by the ingenuity of native people doing theater on their own terms who didn't go through the sausage factory of academia for what theater's supposed to be. And it's brilliant. And I just I just think that that's that's um, that's a really wonderful thing. And one last thing I'll say, I was very, very um, lucky. Um, I just saw the opening of a play of mine that I wrote 13 years ago that never got produced. <laughs> and, um, and it was at Fort Lewis College. And like the native actors, like the number of young native actors, and they were just brilliant, amazing actors. And so I, I was, I was just shocked because when I went through my, my, um, when I got my degree, I was the only native person in the theater department and it caused deep fear for me every day. <laughs> but, but I just think, um, I think it's really, I think that, um, there's going to be way more native folks doing theater and, um, and I'm excited to see what, uh, new stories and new ways that, um, uh, ground is broken. Great, great. Thank, thank you, Rihanna. And my, my apologies for my little technical uh, difficulty <laughs> um, uh, uh, a few minutes ago. If I may just ask a, a quick follow-up question, um, what do you um, what do you think the the increase perhaps in in native um, uh, or young native people wanting to go into the arts may, may be compared to compared to previous generations? Well, my, my answer might be a little pessimistic and I, I wasn't going to say it, but <laughs> I did okay. wonder, I did wonder if, um, but I think this is a larger question we are constantly asking ourselves as Native people is like, as we have next generations, um, how, how, um, um, I, I, th I think that there, there's more, um, you know, when I think about my generation, when I think about my father's generation and my grandmother's, there's this successive access to larger, the larger American society, right? Okay. And, mm -hmm. and so now it's sort of like, oh, okay, there's this next generation who are digital natives, right? Who have had all of this technology. So it makes me, it does, maybe it's not a pessimistic answer, but it does, it does tell me that that there's a certain cultural element that is no longer as big of a gatekeeper to keep native people out. Because I think when I think of my father ever trying to do theater, that 
his cultural difference with mainstream theater, like doing theater would have been miles apart. Like, okay. um, and then I think about like my own experience starting off, it was like, it was painful, <laughs> but, it, but I got through it. But that was because I had so much like support from some helpful adults. Um, and so I wonder if that's a part of it, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I, I guess I just, I don't want to assume that's because, oh, we, our cultures are, are becoming less or whatever. I mean, that's absolutely not something to assume. In fact, I think native Xennials are like way more political and way more deeply into um, revitalization of culture than I've seen in so long. So, so yeah, I don't think it's pessimistic answer. Yeah. I just had to talk it out. <laughs> <laughs> no, totally totally yeah yeah i don't think it's um it, it's complex right we talked about some of the you know complexities earlier so um uh, so vicky uh, um I'll, I'll i'll turn to you now in terms of like what are your um what are your thoughts and and hopes on on the future of of, of native theater as as we come out of uh this uh pandemic well I have to, again, echo some of the things that Rihanna said, because one of the things I noticed during the pandemic is when we, when we started the Zoom process, and again, there's a lot of mixed response to Zoom as a theater substitute or a stand-in or, or, you know, this as, as an, altern you know, an alternate version of theater. But what I will say is the, that Zoom gave us a, that back that sense of community and it's it was pan it was pan native uh, but we also had access to our own communities directly if we were part of the diaspora you know we moved out moved on um, we could reach back and reach out to people of our nation and uh, create together and that was the biggest thing about zoom is i well alternately feeling thoroughly cut off from theater theaters themselves, I felt like a larger part of the theater, indigenous theater community, I felt like a stronger link than I ever have before because of how siloed we normally are. You know, there's just a few of us in, like New York is a bigger um, collection of indigenous folks than most places. So you can, we, you know, we can find a fairly decent sized group of us when, when we're all in town. But generally as a rule of thumb, you know, you go somewhere and you're lucky if you you get the native people and like find two native people in the area to come out to your show. And uh, so I, I definitely really appreciate that that digital access that these kids are more accustomed to and better with working with than I has opened up possibilities for them because I've been teaching as well over this period and um, you know, the work with Alter Theater with reaching out to the Fort Peck reservation and other kids that are scattered across the country who grew up like, like we did without having any idea of the, if theater, theater, that's a possibility. Like what's the difference between theater and a film or what's the difference between theater and TV? Because where I went to school, there was no drama club. There was no teaching. You know, if we read any play, it was Hamlet in English class. <laughs> and it was part of the curriculum at all. And there are some kids who don't even have access to that. And so I definitely see that post pandemic, that possibilities have been open. I've seen some young faces starting to realize that they get to use their voice and their voice is valuable, that people respond to their voice. Like w watching these kids realize they write something or they create a piece together. And just seeing that look on their faces when they put it together and perform it or they, they read it or some an actor reads it for them that they get this sort of validation, this confidence that I never had probably Rihanna never had, that their voices had value, have value. So that's what I see. I see the wave coming up big, guys. I see more and more, they're gonna be seeing more and more indigenous faces around and holding them accountable. And I'm excited for it, I'm, I'm hopeful. I, I'm 
feeling, you know, with all the work that is being done with the activism uh, that the millennials are doing, it's breaking down barriers. And we have people with the focus who are starting to, to go, go ahead and claim the place. Because I know when I was younger, I was an activist too, but I also, and I can't cure myself of this yet, um, hover by the door and wait to be invited in versus these kids will just walk in. And I love it. I love that confidence in their presence. And and yeah, I think there's gonna be a wave of these wonderful creatives. These kids are gonna just knock everybody's socks off. That's for me. <laughs> oh, that, that, that's awesome. That's awesome, yep. Yeah, yeah. And, um, um, and and Mara, um, would, would you mind um, yeah, sharing with us uh, your thoughts and, um, and hopes in regards to in regards to a native dance, um, and you know, performing arts uh, post uh, post pandemic. Um, I'm going to answer with just a question thought, um, sure. but uh, right when Standing Rock first started, I had the chance to go up there. I, there was supplies that had to go from Haskell to Standing Rock, and I happened to have a truck, so we took them up there, but. Um, at that point, it was still early. And what I remember seeing is that there were camps from different nations, right? From all these different nations uh, from within the United States, from Guatemala, from Canada. There were people that had come from some Pacific places. Um, Black Lives Matter people were there actually. Uh, Cherokee Nation was bringing in stuff. Someone had arrived on a horse, I think, from Crow Nation. There's all different peoples. And when I looked, you know, you, you got there, you dropped off your supplies. There was a line of people to, so, to sort them, you know, to say, okay, you have coats. We're going to put them over here. Um, there was cooking going on. There were, you know, women that were in the kitchen that were preparing food for everyone. There was buffalo, there was all peaches, there was all different types of traditional food that was healthy. The toilets were set up to be, um, what's the word when it's not making, well, the toilets are waste, but th where it's, um, I can't think of the word. This It's this recycling fashion. <laughs> Hopefully you know what I'm trying to say. Um, but this was done, with nation collaborating with nation, with people collaborating with people without the United States. It wasn't done for the United States. It wasn't done for the systems of the United States. It was done outside of those systems. So to me, I, I look to that and whether or, you know, regardless of what had happened afterwards and how things are going, that can never be taken away, right? that happened and will continue, it will never go away that that has happened, those coming togethers of nations. So nation building, nation building, I'm not so, I really don't, I don't wanna say I don't care about the United States, I care about the human beings that are here and the plants and the trees, but that structure is not very interesting to me and I personally hope it goes away. Um, so the nation building, <laughs> that that is my answer, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, I, absolutely. I, I, um, I know I've said that a lot, you know, absolutely. in in, in this, in this moderation, but I, I mean, that's the best word I can, I can, you know, think of to, to second everything that everyone has said. Um, but yeah, I, a nation building and, and, and solidarity. And, uh, we certainly saw that as, as standing rock and, and I, and I would say, you know, if there's anything to come out of this, um, you know, horrible pandemic, yeah, um, it has. I feel, and I guess I'm speaking personally, um, that uh, it's helped get us at least, you know, some of us, and we back to basics, right? Like, like what really matters: the storytelling, our community, solidarity. I mean, that's in the end that that that's the most important thing. I mean, back back to those values. Um, um, well, I want to say Wanishi to 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 all of our panelists and to everyone here. Um, you know, again, speaking for myself, I really felt like this this the today's panel was like medicine for me, uh, and it really does help to get back to that moral compass, which I, I believe was also said um, today. 
Um, and, um, and yeah, I mean, I, I certainly hope that, and, and will certainly, uh, you know, do everything I can in terms of, uh, you know, trying to help, you know, the next generation and current, you know, as long with current generations and of native theater and native dance and performing arts in terms of telling their stories and opportunities. And, and, and it is, um, uh, one of our, uh, goals, uh, and one of my, uh, objectives here also at, at the CUNY Graduate Center, which is Prelude Festival as a part of, is to also work on documenting um, Native performing arts that's happening in, in, in the, you know, in, um, in perhaps a new journal uh, and whatnot that'll be for, for Native performing artists. So, um, so I, I do hope that can all be part of the, of the future. Um, and so, uh, again, uh, Wanishi, uh, to everyone uh, listening, um, and this is Opalanya Ted coming to you from the Lenape Island of Manahata. <laughs> so take care and have a good evening. Bye.